And now it's the turn of the leader of the Conservatives and the current Prime Minister, David Cameron. Prime Minister, thank you very much for making it. Cheers. OK, let's kick straight in. Michael Adams has the first question and is just... Let's give a little chance to get an eye on the Prime Minister. Michael. Hello. Um, how are people on zero-hour contracts expected to pay for their food, rent, travel and then expected to pay, plan for their financial futures? Well, what we want, Michael, is to make sure we've got decent jobs for everybody. And in this economy, we have seen more people get work, about 1.75 million more people getting work since I became Prime Minister. But there is no doubt that you're right. There are some zero-hours contracts where people are abused. And so we've said these zero-hours contracts where companies can effectively forbid you from working for anybody else, we've said that is wrong and we've legislated to stop that. Now, some people, though, value having flexible contracts. Some individuals value it, some businesses and others value it. So I don't think it would be right to ban these contracts altogether, but it is right to ban the abuse, and that's what we've done. Is that convincing for you? Um, one of my problems is, I think, for young people, I think these contracts can be really good for working parents and things like that, but for young people, they get pressured into signing these contracts and working irregular hours, and they don't have any money, and we don't see careers. We just see these small, yeah. dead-end jobs, but we don't actually see careers where we can build a future. No, well, I think you're right, Michael. Look, we want a, an economy and a country where if you work hard and you get the qualifications, you should be able to get a decent job. And that's one of the reasons why we've spent so much and invested so much in apprenticeships. Because I think, as the Deputy Prime Minister was saying earlier, Nick Clegg, OK, the apprenticeship minimum wage is not that high, but the training you get and the experience you get should mean you go on to get a really good job having been an apprentice. So my vision for the country is, as you leave school, everyone should have the chance either of doing an apprenticeship or going to a university. That's, that's, that's what we should encourage. And then you're going to get more well-paid jobs and fewer uh, badly paid jobs. That, that's the key for the future. OK, there's somebody that wants to come in here at the back. Let me get a microphone to you. Red. Hi, David. Hi there. You say that um, it's good for people to go to university, but at the same time, there are graduates and undergraduates who have no jobs that are high employment. Would you say to this? Well, what I think is what we should do as a country is make available apprenticeships and university places so that everyone who feels they can benefit from going to university can go. So one of the things we've done as a government, we, there used to be a cap on the number of students who could go to university. We've taken that cap off so it's someone's choice whether they want to go. I think we need good careers advice in schools so we give people better information about uh, what different choices can lead to. But today in Britain, because we're creating so many jobs, because we've got more vacancies than at any time uh, in recent years in our economy, uh, people coming out of university do have the chance of getting a job how? and we need to help them. Well, how? By, by applying for work. Yeah, what works? Well, no, there's lots of work. There's lots of jobs being created here in Britain. I mean, let's take, right, we're standing here in London. I became Prime Minister four and a half years ago. Compared with four and a half years ago, there's over 400,000 more people in work. Now, of course, some of those will be less well-paid jobs, but we've also been creating jobs in more skilled trades as well. So if you're saying to me, look, people leaving university, there aren't jobs for them, we've got more vacancies in our country than we've had for the last five, six, seven years. So the jobs are there, and I would advise, when it comes to my own children, who are still at primary school, I'd advise them, as you go through school, think about either doing an apprenticeship or think about going to university rather than leaving school um, at 16 or 18. I think that's the future uh, for our country. And I think it's good. We've got well-funded, good universities in Britain. Although that took, as I know you've been discussing today, that took some difficult decisions about tuition fees and, and such like. But it means our universities are some of the best anywhere in Europe. And so if you're a young person in Britain today and you get to a good school and a good university, you've got every chance of a good career. I think Elizabeth just wants to come back in on this. Just a quick um, point, I Elizabeth. think as a young person, I've come to terms with the fact that I've got to pay tuition fees, but actually I'm really concerned about the young people who are going to university and therefore don't have student finance in place, don't have other resources to help them into that transition to adulthood, and I think the government needs to be doing more to support those young people. What do you mean people who are, who are leaving school without going to university? or Young people who believe yeah. university isn't right for them because yeah. on an apprenticeship as we mentioned earlier yeah. there's not enough to support yourself and at university I get support with living which is fantastic yeah. but young people um, at 18 shouldn't feel like they need to rely on their parents anymore if they choose not to go to university I don't think it's good enough at the moment. Well, I, was saying, I think the, the, the right approach 
for a country in, a, in the modern world with the world changing around us and new countries on the rise, the right thing is to try to say to young people, look, leaving school at 18, uh, rather than having an apprenticeship or going to university, you're more likely to have a successful career and a well-paid job if you do one of the two. Uh, and the truth is with apprenticeships, uh, that actually most people who do apprenticeships, that adds to your power to earn money later on in your life. I was, I was at Dagenham the other day, the Ford Works. People doing a four-year apprenticeship there. At the end of those four years, uh, I asked them what they were going to be earning, and they were hoping to earn up to £30,000 after a four-year apprenticeship. So it's a good thing to do, an apprenticeship, and that's why we put money into them. Quick, we're going to move on, quickly, we're going to move on okay. Elizabeth. We're going to move on. Okay, Francesca, second question, please. Thank you. Hi. Why did Britain fly the Saudi flag at half-mast if the country has such an appalling human rights record? The reason for doing that was that there's a long-standing relationship between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and our United Kingdom here, a relationship between our monarchs, a relationship between the governments. We don't agree with lots of things that the Saudis do. We don't agree with the way they uh, treat people, for instance, criminals, when we make very clear those differences. But when the king died, as a mark of respect, um, we thought it was right to show that respect. But isn't that disrespectful to the people who the Saudi king has sentenced to a thousand lashes? What? And uh, you uh, mentioned that there's a relation... <laughs> you mentioned there's a relationship between the British mm. government and the, the Saudi yeah. monarch and vice versa. But that's not a relationship that I'm going to guess from that judge of a round of applause. That's not a relationship yeah. shared, shared by the citizens. No, well, uh, look, as Which isn't very okay, I, I let, I'll try and answer your question really directly because I know how um, concerned people were about that because they look at things that happen in Saudi Arabia and think, why do we have this relationship? Let, let me tell you, as Prime Minister, why I think it's worthwhile. We have a relationship with Saudi Arabia, partly over things like trying to achieve peace in the Middle East, but crucially, over fighting terrorism. Now, I can it's tell you. Oil. Yeah, please, one point. I promise I'll <laughs> shut up. You've had been poor, you've been listening to politicians all day. But I can tell you one time since I've been Prime Minister, a piece of information that we've been given um, by that country has saved potentially hundreds of lives here in Britain. Now, you can be Prime Minister and just say exactly what you think about every regime in the world and make great headlines and give great speeches, but I think my first job is to try and keep this country safe from terrorism. And if that means you have to build strong relationships, sometimes with regimes you don't always agree with, that, I think, is part of the job. And, and that's the way I do it. And that's the best way I can explain it. Just on that question, Prime Minister, Abraham over sure. here has a follow-up. Hi, yeah. Hi, so, Abraham. I mean, you've spoken about the relationship that we have and about how this is informed by fighting terrorism. Do you think oil has anything to do with it? Yes, of course, yes. <laughs> no, I think it's... Uh... I think it's very important to answer that question directly and say, yes, of course, Britain needs to have relationships with countries that we trade with, including those that we buy oil and gas from. We can't make all our own oil and gas uh, here in the UK. We're doing well because we've got North Sea oil. So, yes, we do have relationships with these countries, but it's perfectly possible... To, to turn have... a blind eye to human rights abuses? Well, it, no, well, it's not what we do. It's perfectly possible to go to those countries, as I do, and, and raise human rights abuses with them. Indeed, I would argue... If you have a relationship with them and you have a way of talking to them, they're more likely to listen to you than if you just cut yourself off. And as I say, it's very easy as Prime Minister to grandstand and make the speeches and say this and say that, but actually you have no influence in the world if you do that. Whereas if you have a relationship, when you think they're making a mistake, you can say that to them, and I think you've got more chance of being listened to. OK, moving on to the next question. Sam. Hey. Hi, Prime Sam. Minister, with the war on drugs failing, would you consider treating drugs as a health issue rather than a criminal one? Well, I think that, um, first of all, it's good that actually drug use in Britain is going down, not up. And I think that's partly because we have been taking not just a medical approach to it, but also a more educational approach to it. The real focus of this government on drugs has not been to change the laws. I don't support that. It's still a criminal offence, so we should still go after people that deal and sell to young people and all the rest of it. But we have tried to put more emphasis on educating people properly about the dangers of drugs and then much more emphasis on treatment. And by treatment, I mean not just giving people substitute drugs, but trying to help get people off drugs. And I think that's partly why we see drug use coming down. So we haven't cracked it, but it's heading in the right direction. But I wouldn't change the criminal law. I think that'd be a mistake. I think for lots of parents, they'd think, hold on, I'm trying to keep my children away from these things. And if you change the criminal law, I think you send quite a signal that it's hard for them for parents to, to work out how to 
talk to their own children about it. So I'd say keep the law as it is, focus on the treatment, focus on the health, focus on getting people clean. Convinced, Sam? Uh, not convinced, but I understand your arguments. Okay, okay. anybody yeah. want to come back on this issue on, on, on drugs? Can, can I just borrow your microphone? Again, my, Hi. Hi. my dissertation this year is actually on drug policy. Yeah. And a few years ago, you said that you would reconsider this. Yes. And I don't believe anybody who's in politics is in this for the wrong reasons. You're constrained. But wouldn't it be better just to say that and then people would maybe relate to you more? Because until you well, became prime minister, you were for it. No, no. We, we, I sat on a Home Affairs Select Committee that had a good look at this. We didn't actually come down on the side of, of uh, legalisation. We had a good look at it. Look. If you're saying politicians are constrained because they have to think about what other people think, yes, that's true, but that's part of being in a democracy, trying to represent people's opinions, understand people's concerns. I, I having spent a lot of time thinking about it, I think changing the law and decriminalizing drugs when we're trying to reduce their use, I think that would probably lead to an increase in their use, so I don't support it. But I don't think the criminal law is the whole answer to drugs. I think the answer to drugs is education, is treatment, uh, and trying to help people lead drug-free lives. And there, as I said, I think there's some signs of success there. OK, we're going to push on to a question from Facebook, which we'll see on the screen. Coming up, Christopher Iden, why are the Tories going to scrap housing benefit for 16 to 21-year-olds when every pensioner still gets the winter right. fuel allowance? Well, the reason for this is, I think, as I've been saying earlier, when young people leave school, I think there should be opportunities to earn by doing an apprenticeship or getting a job or opportunities to learn by an apprenticeship or going to university. But I think the option of leaving school, signing on, moving out of home, getting a flat and living on housing benefit, I don't think that is any start to a life at all. So I don't think it should be an option. Now, of course, there are some people who, for whatever reason, cannot live at home and have to be away from their parents, and they we will always help. But the option that some people have today of leaving school, signing on unemployed, getting a flat, getting housing benefit. I don't think that is a good option for young people, and I don't think it should be available. Anyone on housing benefit here wants to come back on that? Well, let's go on. I, I think that that's a very um, bad approach, because you're using an example of a small minority of people that just sign on for the sake of signing on to punish a large majority of the people who actually do sign on for so many reasons. You know, they have kids, so they can't leave at home because of family issues and problems. As somebody who can actually leave at home at 18, who decided to go back to FE college and then are now at uni, housing benefit was the only way that I could do it. And I think that you're making a big mistake by taking that away from young people. Well, I, I don't agree that uh, this is somehow a tiny minority of people. What I'm saying is if you have to leave home, if you can't stay at home, then of course you should make that benefit available. But today as we speak, there is the option as you leave school to go and sign on, to get unemployment benefit, and then to get a flat and housing benefit. And I just think that is a bad way to start your life. It's much better to go on and do either an apprenticeship or go to university or go to college or get a job. Those are better options. And I don't think this idea that you can say to people it's okay somehow to opt out of uh, working life and training i think is a bad approach and we shouldn't do it okay over to brendan for the next question i sort of have a follow-on question from that which sure. is what will you do to improve the housing crisis across the uk and tackle high rents particularly in london we've got to build more houses is the short answer in the end of the day if you don't have a, enough of something it becomes too expensive either to buy or to rent so the short answer is build more houses which we are now doing we've reformed the planning system houses and flats are, are getting built I actually agree with something Nick Clegg was saying to you, which is making sure that as well as the six-month assured tenancies, there are longer tenancies available as well. But the big thing I'd like to do is build more homes that young people can buy, what we call starter homes. So basically build them, uh, for, uh, sell them at 80% of the normal market price, and reserve them and say these are only to be bought by people under the age of 40. You can't sell them to buy to let landlords who go on and rent them. Because I think lots of people who leave school, leave university, get a job, start working. They're earning enough often to pay a mortgage, but they can't get the deposit together. And I want to see those people be able to achieve the dream of owning a flat or a home of their own. OK, just a follow-up point on this issue from Tim. Sure. Yeah. Hi, Tim. It seems to me that a lot of these problems recently mentioned are uh, all about the deficit, the lack of money. Yeah. Um, and yet, in the past few years, uh, while your government has been in power, there just seems to be money wasted on needless exercises. Uh, the badger call, for example, that wasted millions of pounds and it ended up costing more than it saved, which just okay, seems well, let's, let's say the badger call, because this is probably <laughs> the most unpopular policy for which I'm responsible. And I'm going to try and explain to you, Tim, why I think it's the right thing to do. We've lost um, £500 million by paying 
compensation to farmers whose cattle have caught TB. And if we don't do anything about this scourge of TB, which is, by the way, terrible for badgers as well as terrible <laughs> for cattle, it's going to cost us a billion pounds over the next 10 years. Now, sometimes in politics, you've got to do the thing which you believe is right, even though you know it's unpopular. Now, I know it is very unpopular um, culling badgers, but I profoundly believe that part of the way, only part of the way, but part of the way of trying to create some areas of the country that are TB-free is to do this. So it's very, very difficult, but I believe it's the right thing to do. And that's, in the end, you know, you have to make choices as a politician. Sometimes, and sometimes it means doing something which you know people don't like. Tim, sorry, you're, Tim. You're supposed to ask about housing. You asked about badgers. Oh, sorry, that's I can't bad. Do well, that's all right. it's, uh, you know, we haven't covered lots of subjects. For the five, so that's good. Rebecca. Yeah. Rebecca. Thank you. What would be the future of devolution in Wales and Scotland under your party if you were to win the next general election? Well, the short, a bright future for devolution <laughs> because uh, we've agreed, all the parties have agreed with respect to Scotland, there should be a stronger Scottish Parliament. So whoever wins this election, there'll be a bill in the House of Commons straight after the election. If I'm Prime Minister, it'll be in the first Queen's speech. It'll go through stronger Scottish Parliament. I think we're going to get a stronger Welsh Parliament too. There are talks going on right now and they finish on about the 1st of March. <coughs> Um, so I think we'll see good progress there. But I want something else, which is I think that it's right that if Scotland has its parliament and Wales has its parliament and they decide housing and education and welfare and things like that in those countries, then it's right that in the Westminster parliament, when English MPs are discussing these issues, they should have the decisive say, so-called English votes for English laws. So I want to fix that one too. Are you convinced by that, Rebecca? Yeah, I think so. You are there with Cardinal. Lots of convincing going on today. Right, let's take one from Facebook from uh, Karen McDonald. Which party leader will eradicate the farcical Prime Minister's Question Time? Don't we have enough comedies on TV without having yeah. this rerun over and over again and again? Oh, now this is the. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, look, I, I, at five minutes to 12 every Wednesday, I can tell you, I put my head in my hands and think, why have I got to do this? It's a nightmare. Um, but. Does it have a purpose? I don't know. Maybe you all think it, it hasn't got it. I think there, is, there are two points to it, I suppose. One is that members of parliament, from whatever party, they can ask you any question they like. And so you've got to try and be on top of your game and on top of everything that's happening. And that has a knock-on advantage, which is it means that as prime minister, you've got to know everything that's going on in your government. And so it does enforce some accountability of the departments and the ministers to you and through you to Parliament. So yes, it is noisy and crazy and infuriating and all the rest of it, but there is some, some sort of point to it. Does that make any sense? Well, uh, well let's ask uh, the well, audience. Let's ask Chris. Chris. What do you think, Chris? PM, Scrap think, it or I, do it? I think PMQs is horrible. I think it's one of the biggest disengagers for voters. Right. Um, and I think it's really petty. I think everybody involved, including yourself, yeah. um, you stand there, <laughs> you stand there, and you can't, you're shouting at other members of the house. Yeah. It's disgusting, and I think it's horrible. Yes. I think, well, I think it's Chris, I, I, I have every sympathy. Uh, I want to say maybe I'll get you a ticket. And you can come and sit in the House <laughs> of Commons chamber, I, I, and you I'm can really see the, the noise that, that is in there. And that is why sometimes you do have to shout just to try and make yourself heard. I agree. It is look, it is not representative of what Parliament does. Ninety. 8% of what Parliament does is scrutinising legislation, questioning ministers more responsibly, the work of select committees, making sure our laws make sense. I mean, there's some really good work done in Parliament. This is like one piece. And it is, you're right, it is like the sort of Roman circus. But I, I look, the last person to ask to change it, in a way, if I change it, said, you know what, let's get rid of this. I think people would think you're running away from accountability. So I don't think I can do it, but I, I do wish we could make it a bit more responsible. Sheila, a quick, a quick point on, uh, on this? Um, yeah, what are you going to do to engage young people in politics or, like, into voting? Because, for, as Chris said, like, um, Prime Minister's Question Time is not engaging. No. We just see a load of people, people who are supposed shouting. to be yeah. running, running our country and supposed to be more responsible yeah. than us just shouting at each other and just passing yeah. the blame. We don't actually get any answers. Yeah. And a lot of young people feel, well, I can't trust them because I can't even trust them to act civil yeah. and run our country yeah. in a proper way. But then... 16-year-olds are deemed as, uh, like, not able to vote yeah. because of this when we've got 40-plus-year-olds yeah. arguing in a place that's supposed yeah. to make laws and supposed to run our country. So I'm just thinking, what are you going to do to engage young people more and make them see, actually, no, you can actually make a change? I, I think the best thing, the best thing that I do as a local MP is just go into secondary schools and sit down with a sick form and have a proper reasoned debate, say a few words about what 
I think about politics, but then lots of time for loads of questions and answers. And I do that in the secondary schools in my constituency. I try and do it in other parts of the country. I think that's probably the single best thing because then you're talking to people, whether they're 16 or 18, you know, about the things they care about. And I think more of that would be a good thing. Okay, we're going to move on to Hanan's question. Hanan. Hi, David. Hi, Hanan. Uh, as a young British Muslim, I've seen that the community is experiencing the negative effect of counter-terrorism laws. So what I would like to ask is, what is your government doing to support and engage the vast majority of Muslim community who are not engaged in any uh, terrorist activities and who want to take a, a strong leadership role mm. in this tackle this issue? Thank well, you. I think the most important thing we can do is literally to engage with, as you say, the overwhelming majority of British Muslims who want nothing to do with this appalling extremism and terror. And one of the things I think has been really impressive in, in recent months and years is when one of these outrages takes place, the first people to get out there, whether on Twitter or on the television or radio or wherever, is leaders of the British Muslim community condemning what has happened. And I think that has been incredibly powerful. Uh, I saw uh, President Obama the other day actually highlighted the not in my name hashtag campaign that was on Twitter from British Muslims and said that was an example uh, to the whole world. But I think we need to do more to explain to everybody that this is the people we're talking about is a minority of a minority. It's a tight, you know, but they are spreading a poisonous narrative of extremism and terror that we've got to fight. But is your, is your government doing anything to actually engage with the leaders, the community leaders, yes. the mosque leaders, to actually take a heed, you know, a, a responsibility and also a leadership role? Because right now you've got the Prevent uh, program that, that Ed Miliband mentioned yeah. earlier is under the police uh, control. Leaders are not involved. They're not really part of this process. They're not really being no, we, given... We, you're absolutely right. We have, we have the Prevent program, which is more about... Uh, trying to prevent people from getting involved in terror, and that is more of a criminal justice sort of intervention. But then through the Department of Local Government, we have a big engagement program with British Muslim communities and British Muslim leaders uh, to talk to them about these issues, about how we fight Islamophobia, for how we include people better in our country, how we make sure that when these appalling things happen, um, British Muslims are the first to come out and condemn them. So I think there is a good program. What, what my government did was it split these two programs in apart on the advice of uh, a very senior, actually, Liberal Democrat um, uh, legislator who said they got rather muddled and it was better to have a prevent program to steer people away from terror and then have an engagement program through the Department of Local Government to try and bring communities closer together. Okay, we're going to move on in south. Hi. Um, my university started selling sanitary products profit-free. I just want to know if you'd do the same. It oh, sounds a really good idea. Which university is that in South? The uh, University of East Anglia. U university of East Anglia. What are you reading? English literature. Enjoying it? Yeah. Think it's worthwhile? We were going through this conversation earlier about <laughs> uh, uh, universities and degrees. You confident? Yeah, I love that, good. Yeah. It sounds like a great idea. I think just to clarify, you were saying about removing VAT. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh sorry, VAT. VAT. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, this is a long standing campaign. I have had a look at it in the past. I think it's quite difficult. To, some VAT things you can change. Other VAT things, if they're linked to other products, it's quite difficult. Um, to do it within the framework of European laws, and I can't remember the answer. So I have to budget find. I think. I think. I think it's very difficult to do, but I'll have to go away and have a look and come back to you and stuff. So. Okay, I think we're going to go to a Facebook question now from uh, Daniel Green. Uh, what are your views on online voting, and do you think 16, 17 year olds should be allowed to vote in elections? Right. Well, if you think I've said some unpopular things so far, wait for this. Uh, I, I'm afraid. I think the you've got to have one age of majority. And I think 18 is, in my view, I, I understand the case for votes for 16 and 17-year-olds, but my view is 18 is a, is a better age. It's the age where so many other things kick in, and I think it would be better to save that voting age for, for 18. Online voting, I mean, I don't have any objection to it, but I think, in a way, we're asking the wrong question. You know, the reason people don't vote is not because it's too complicated to go down to the polling station. The reason people don't vote is they don't think it makes enough of a difference. And so I think we ought to focus on trying to make sure our politics is delivering the things people want, uh, rather than simply just trying to work out how do we make it easier to vote. OK, follow-up on that. Or do you say that you, you, know, you don't think that online yeah. voting is the right thing, or is it because politicians were afraid of what would happen yeah. if people would vote from home and no, from I'm mobile? Not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in the no, I don't, have any, I don't have any great objection to it. As I say, but you could have... Some people say, why don't we vote on a Sunday? Make it easier when some people aren't working. Some people say, why don't we vote for you know, three days in a row rather than just one day? Why don't we vote online? Uh, we have more postal voting. 
these are all good ideas to discuss, but I think they, the, peop the reason people don't vote is not because it's too complicated to go down to the polling station. So I think we're slightly missing the point. So I don't have an objection to these methods if we can make sure there's no fraud and all the rest of it. But I think it's not really why people aren't voting. Okay, next question from Fope. So it follows on quite nicely. Hi. Yes, hello. Um, so okay. we're sort of talking about what discourages people from voting. And I think for me, something that comes into play is that I kind of agree with some policies of one party and agree with other bits of another policy. So it's kind of hard to align myself mm. specifically with one party. So now looking at the coalition, do you think that cross-party initiatives will kind of be steering the progression of democracy and government in the UK? Yeah. Well, I mean, the coalition was a bit of a new departure. We hadn't had one for... 70 years in our country, and I, I hope it showed that when there isn't a decisive result, politicians can put aside their own political interests and try and work together. That's, we're all, look, all the ones you've heard from today, we have different views about all sorts of things, but we all actually love this country, we want to serve our country, we believe that our political system can deliver. That's what brings us together. I think one of the things we ought to try and do is maybe more free votes, more occasions when Parliament isn't voting because people are whipped by their party to do so. Uh, I also think we've had quite a few uh, referendums in recent years, and I think that's a good way to ask people their view. I think you ought to all, you know, have a view on Europe and whether we should stay in the European Union. We haven't had a vote on this in this country since 1975, and that's why I'm saying if I'm Prime Minister uh, in, uh, after May the 7th, we'll, we'll have a vote on that. So that's one way to kind of break down some of the party strictures, free votes in Parliament. We've got one tomorrow on whether you should be able to transfer DNA in, in order to avoid some uh, genetic diseases for children. That's a free vote. More of those, maybe some more referendums. Okay, follow up on that from Holly. Uh, a little bit, yeah, about Hi. people feeling disengaged um, with voting. Um, Natalie Bennett mentioned earlier it's been 100 years since women got the vote nearly. Um, why aren't any parties taking it seriously that women still aren't being paid as much as men? I feel like that's why, I mean, if I was a woman looking at voting, if a, if a party said that they were going to take that seriously, they'd automatically have my vote, and I don't feel like... Well, I, I think, I, I am taking it seriously. I think it's a very important issue. It's a scandal. I mean, the pay gap for under-40s is now almost gone, so we've made some good progress. It shouldn't have taken so long, but it has almost gone. Over 40s, there's still a pay gap, and we need to address that. We've brought in this thing where any company that is found uh, to have got this wrong at a tribunal then has to have a pay audit throughout their company to see whether uh, we can improve on the, you know, to see whether they need to change all their practices. There are a lot of things we need to do. Make childcare easier and more affordable. Uh, encourage women back into the workforce after they've had their children. Lots of things we can do. Make sure public appointments more women are, are taking up. Make sure that politics has got better representation of women, where my party was one of the back markers. We're doing a bit better now, and uh, we need to keep at it. Convinced, yes or no? <laughs> Not particularly. Okay, well, well, maybe we can do some more convincing <laughs> later if you want to. Uh, we're going to go to our last question from uh, Charlie. Sorry, from Hi. Charlie. There we go. Hi, Hi David. Hi, Charlie. Hi. Um, now, if you look around this room, people that are engaged in politics come from a multitude of backgrounds. However, just 4.2% of MPs in the House of Commons are from an ethnic minority, despite 12.9% yeah. making up the population. Just over one in five women um, are MPs in the yeah. House of Commons. Now, given this, can we say that Parliament is a truly representative institution? And can we really trust you to create policies that encompass uh, concerns of marginalised groups? Uh, I think the short answer to your question is today, Parliament is not properly representative of the country. It has changed and got better in that there are now more women MPs and more members of Parliament from black and minority ethnic communities, but not enough. I mean, my party is a good example. Before the last election, we had 17 women MPs. We've now got over 50. That's still not enough when you think I've got 300 members of parliament, but it's progress. Before the last election, we had very few uh, members of parliament from black and minority ethnic groups. We now have uh, British Sikhs, British Asians, uh, black British people on the conservative benches. The culture secretary, Sajid Javid, uh, is a British Muslim, full member of the cabinet. So, you know, for a second generation um, immigrant. So I think we are making progress but we haven't done enough. But I think it's a really important thing about our country that actually people can come from other parts of the world and in one or two generations, I want to see them be able to sit around that cabinet table or be captains of industry or senior judges in the land. It's happening and it's a precious thing we've got, but we've got to push it harder and faster. Just one last follow-up from just 
behind. Hi, Bye. David. Um, Hi, I'm Venanda, and Vinanda. Um, you were talking about how Parliament is not only not representative, but you said that everyone should have a view. But why should 16 and 17 year olds have a view if your party isn't willing to listen to us, isn't willing to understand and try to take into consideration the fact that things are being done towards us and we're not being listened yeah. to because we can't vote? No, I think we should listen. We should listen to everyone in our country. But then we have a responsibility. Members of Parliament have a responsibility to decide who gets to vote. Now, my view is that we should have a vote on this. I think it's time we should vote on it. I still think 18 is the right age because it's the age when so many other things of majority happen. But it's a perfectly legitimate debate whether it should be 16, 17 or 18. Personally, I go for 18 and I find quite strong support for that um, around the country. But let's by all means have the, have the debate and have the argument. It's well, I, I think we've got, to, we've got to leave it there. <laughs> the Prime Minister has answered a series of questions from around the world. <laughs> Uh, we appreciate your time, Prime Minister. Thank you very much. That's it for the session. Thank you, David Cameron. That's a round of applause to the Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, don't forget, we'll have a special programme featuring all four political party leaders on Sky News at 8.30 tonight. If you still have questions for Mr Cameron, he'll be answering those in a live Facebook Q&A as soon as he comes off the set. We'll have full analysis coming up, and you can join in the debate on social media. Just use the hashtag AskTheLeaders. <laughs> Thank you, Prime Thanks Minister. So really appreciate that. Thank I think you. these guys are going to join That's you on stage good. now. Great. Thank you. So, just because he's the Prime Minister.